so um, my paper is on, as it says here, hip hop as critical pedagogy in academic spaces. Right, so really brief, well, really, yeah, very quickly, actually, um, this is a scope. So this research project was based on a dissertation, which I did quite a while ago, to be honest, and it's a critical educational research project, and it's based on the perceptions of a higher education um, lecturer based um, in East London, so here in East London. Um, this is a scope that I'm really going to try to cover, very ambitious, I think, but um, the, the background, so who am I and why would I conduct this type of research, um, the processes, including um, some information with regards to the methodology and the methods that I use, and obviously the research data, and I'm, I am hopeful <laughs> to um, present some reflections on my current practice. Like I said, this research was conducted um, quite a while ago. So who am I? Part of the hip-hop community since the early 1980s. Part of the hip-hop communities, not meaning that I'm a DJ or an MC or anything like that, meaning that when I encountered hip-hop, this was the time in the school playground. Can you do this move? And that was it. It took off from there. So that's what I mean by that. Um, why would I do this type of research project? Is because um, my own school experience, to be honest, I'm very much in this research. Um, so I'm going to point that out immediately. So being very disengaged from compulsory education, um, very discontent with the curriculum, just, just not satisfied with a whole lot of things, a whole lot of things, um, and identifying really early in myself as a young person that the best way for me to engage and to learn was through dialogue and creativity. I understood that really early on. And um, so I always, um, and I think a lot of people do, to be fair, engage with um, education and, and knowledge from alternative methods. I always sourced and different sources of information to um, increase my learning or to meaning making, to make meaning of the world around me and my thoughts and my feelings, etc. And um, so, in part, hip-hop has been very pivotal in my own um, personal sort of educational um, journey from the 1980s to date, yeah? So, the project was um, conducted while I was a student at the time. I'm a lecturer at the moment, so I'm really trying to um, stay focused with the delivery of this because a lot of developments have happened since conducting this research. So really briefly, some assumptions um, that I've read through the literature and that's also been posed to me over the course of a few years. Um, Hip-hop as anti-establishment. Hip-hop as youth culture and youth culture as deviant. Hip-hop as dumbing down, dehumanizing our children. You know, the education system may have some issues. However, they're not pedagogical. And also, teachers are equipped with tools to accommodate. So in teacher education, CPDs, teachers are fully equipped with all the tools that they need to work in diverse communities. So um, this is one. It's not the only um, theoretical sort of um, frameworks that I've drawn from, but it's, it's quite central. So this is the only one that I've um, put up there, which is critical pedagogy, which it says here, you can read. So it's, it derives from critical theory, and it's mostly concerned about socialization and dominant ideologies. That's its main concern. Um, critical pedagogy, so it's teaching and learning, the science of teaching and learning, if we're talking about from Freire, um viewpoint or um, school of thought for liberation, for transformation. So we're talking about the banking concept, re referring to Frere, about in education, that Frere believes that in, not education, but in schooling, which is a different thing, in schools at the moment, students are taught to basically regurgitate information. So the teacher is the person that has all the knowledge and imparts it onto the student, and the student basically, in turn, gives that back. Doesn't do any sort of process or anything, just gives it back. So, and there are some 
um, central or most common themes within critical pedagogy, uh, which is um, critical thinking, creativity, reflection, and there's a, a few more other things. So for this research, these are the research questions that um, I was looking to discover. So what are the perceptions of hip-hop's relevance to identities in the UK? Is hip-hop perceived as a brand or an experience? And what are the attitudes towards hip-hop as a tool to facilitate criti critical pedagogy in the UK? So um, these are the methods that I used. So it was semi-structured interviews. I, I use elicitation techniques um, using images, song lyrics, um, which were audio and written, the sorts of things that we would do in classes if you're a hip-hop practitioner. And the rest of it you don't really need to know. It's one subject, so it's one person, it's a single case study. It's a very small project, a very small research. These are some of the key themes that came up through the reading and also within the data that I collected. There was a lot of correlation. So um, critical identity, political identity, transnational capitalism, um, which I'm not going to speak much, um, speak very much about today, but it did come through. I thought it was important to say that. Um, it did come through, and obviously critical pedagogy. So before um, I start to engage with the data that was collected, um, apologies that I don't have the actual methods that I used. Um, I got a little bit frightened and I thought I better not put all the images that I use, all the songs, it was a whole lot. And it wasn't um, sort of snippets of songs, there were whole songs. I took a long time with um, the interview because it's only one person anyway. So um, this extract or quotation here is in relation to what the subject said when I used the image. So I used the image, four images um, of African American um, rap artists. Um, and I'm gonna put my hands up again. There's a lot of putting my hands up that um, most of the artists were artists that um, I sort of grew up with. Um, and um, I don't think that it was probably as diverse in terms of images and genre that it could have been. So I put my hands up for that. So there was Talib Kweli, um, Common, Faro Monch, and Dead Prez. Yeah? And um, just saying that from now, that the songs and the lyrics, everything was the same people. Yeah, so. so this is what the participant um, said when I showed an image of, and I believe this to be common. So the question that I posed was, what do you see? It was just an icebreaker. So this is what she said. She identified basically with blackness, the com commodification of blackness. You can read there. So that was what came out for her at that particular time. It's actually going somewhere while we pull this up. Okay? Now, with regards to the song, so audio recording that I played her, um, these are some of the quotations that I pulled out. Um, I had no idea what she, how she would respond to the lyrics. I don't know if any of you know the tracks, that I'm t well not the tracks, but the artists that I'm referring to. Some of them could be deemed as quite revolutionary. It was, it's quite nuanced, all conscious rap, but quite nuanced in, in terms of um, delivery. So I had no idea how she would respond. And this is from academia and not necessarily someone that has any kind of affiliation to hip hop. So this was the first thing that she said. Um, they're asking people to look at things differently, to see things differently and to pay attention to what's happening around them. The second one, definitely critical thinking. I mean, you know, that's the key to it. So these are the things that she's, she's pulling out. I didn't give her all the information in terms of the theories that I'm looking at, so it was interesting that um, I didn't actually have to decode that. She's using the language, but she would because she's a lecturer, yeah? 
Um, but on the third quotation, um, which I found interesting, was that she started to say something which I thought was really important, and I think I should have really prompted her at this point to say more on reflection after the occasion, um, that there is an acknowledgement that she's pointing out that you're actually playing a whole lot of conscious hip-hop, and that's not a full representation of of hip-hop so this is and then sort of moving on anyway i'm sort of moving on to staying with the track that you're playing and this is my response to it okay so um regards to the actual lyrics so first i thought it's important to play the audio um, i'm not sure what she would have taken from the audio in terms of the speed and everything else that you was talking about i'm not sure what you know in terms of the language and everything else i'm not sure what she understood um, so i thought it's important to show the lyrics afterwards to see if that makes any difference to the response so this was what, how she responded well, I think it connects to the things that, you know, the way that we, and there's a whole lot of sort of stumbling, the subtle ways in which we, what we should be doing with education. It's subtlety, you know, when I first started teaching and I just used to find it extremely oppressive. I didn't make, it didn't make any sense. And for my sanity, I remember I used to listen to, it was, I first started to listen to Public Enemy, He Got Game. Now, if you're going to stereotype what a hip-hop head looks like, I wasn't expecting to hear that. I was a little bit thrown back. Um, so I was like, oh, this is really interesting. As I'm going through the process of this elicitative um, interview technique, what I didn't bank on is a narrative. This is what I started to get. So as we get to the end of the interview session, um, I asked an open question that we love the open questions. Is there anything else you'd like to say? And then it all came out. It was amazing. Um, it all sort of came out at that point. And these are just the bits that um, I thought that I would present today with the given time that I have. So um, it's, you know, taking music to a new direction. And of course, I think for educators, it's going to be quite challenging because through this, young people are learning things with which to challenge what they, you know, what people tell them, the conventional wisdoms. So you're going to get a more critical kind of student. You're going to get a more critical kind of student. And there was some more, but I thought I'd stop there. Yeah? So this is the thing that it almost felt as though these are the things that I wanted to say, now I'm going to say it. Time to process, going through the licitation technique. Things take a little bit of time, yeah? This quotation, please bear with me. It's really lengthy, but I thought it was really important. Really, really important. Um, she says here, I think it's a shame because I think in a way hip hop sets up the antagonisms that you might see being played out in education contexts. So they set it up only one side is aware of the antagonisms and they don't really understand what's going on in the rank, so to speak. So they, by the way, are teachers, yeah? They are teachers in um, a, a school, compulsory school um, context. Then she goes on to say this, they're standing out in the front thinking, what the hell is going on? Why aren't people paying attention to what I got to say? Yes, that's the, the teacher voice. She's been a teacher. She's worked as a teacher. She's worked in higher education. She's been doing it for an awful long time. So these are um, resonates with her. And then she answers the question that she's just posed. Yeah? So because they're not saying it in ways that are particularly clever, you know, if you've got, because why would you? The thing that always strikes me is why would you try to say something when someone else has said it better? <laughs> if a video shoot says things that has been carefully produced and thought out to make statements that you're trying to, why would you not show the video? So that's that critical um, media literacy type of thing, so hip-hop comes in many different forms. So 
I thought that was um, really interesting in terms of bringing up or even a point of discussing the dilemma of something that could be so powerful, um, that has so much scope for de development, but the acknowledgement of not just about teaching in schools and the practicality of using these types of methods, but are teachers ready for, are teachers ready for, as she says, the kind of criticality, the level of criticality, the level of engagement, the level of dialogue that may happen once you open up hip hop to the classroom space. And by the way, I thought I'd just leave it to last. Um, <laughs> like I said, I had no idea. She's not a stereotypical. There was a lot more. 57 years old. Um, and she says she knows all of this because she, she allowed herself to be taught by her son. That's very, um, you know, sort of prevalent in critical pedagogical kind of um, relationships. So it's that lateral learning, that intercommunication, one tier, intergenerational even. So um, the point I'm making is I didn't bank on this data just being so rich and having so much around what it is that I had been engaging with in terms of the reading and my thinking as well. So, like I said, um, the research project was done while I was a student. It was done um, a few years ago. Um, I haven't actually presented it um, before, haven't presented it before, so I'm really happy to have the opportunity to present it because I've done quite a few work off the basis of just this sort of development it's helped me to sort of with my thinking and, and my teaching and learning and in the community and in the academy as well so just some reflections to um, sort of leave you with um, I've started to work with hip-hop pedagogy um, at the university where I work thank you the university where I work um, and um, one year one year now that I've been using um, or lecturing on hip hop pedagogy as critical pedagogy, but also doing some practices in, um, we would call it, I guess, extracurricular kind of um, activities like conferences and things like that, workshops. So these are some of the feedback and um, just for sharing with you the food for thought that I'm going to think about and um, help to inform what it is that I do next in my current role. So. Um, as I said, I'm a higher education lecturer and um, I do teach on a module called Critical Pedagogy at the University of East London. Um, and um, at the University of East London, we also have a conference, you can see here, for International Women's Day. And in that conference, we do um, hip hop feminist um, workshops. Any excuse, I sort of wedge it in, I find a way. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, to be honest, a student actually asked me to do it. They help shape the curriculum and what happens in the program. And because I've introduced it on a module that they take, um, they asked me to, to do it in there. So someone likes it. <laughs> so um, there are some correlations. So um, the participants for the lecture come from three programs, education studies, um, anthropology with education and also youth and community studies. Um, obviously it would be mostly theory but there are there's some practice because that's how I engage with teaching and learning and um, in this context it's primarily to connect the dots between um, hip-hop so the culture some of the principles the pillars everything else um, with the previous course content which is based on um, a, a wide range of topics, to be fair, under the banner of the philosophy of education and critical pedagogy. Um, there are some, obviously there'll be some conversations, we like to call it the cipher, that's what happens in the space as well. A lot of the students go on to become um, postgraduate um, post students, so they go on to teaching training, teacher training, um, so I, I'm at this point in time, I'm finding it really interesting. It's early days, so there's not much to comment on, 
of what actually happens, what's happening when you change the, the curriculum, because it's not just the practice, the curriculum has changed. How does that influence um, potential teachers? And um, so a lot of the students said that they found, not all of them, not all of them, it's not for everyone. A lot of the students said they found it really engaging. Um, retention was really great. Um, and they really excited about the possibilities of using hip hop and found it very illuminating. Though as I uh, have highlighted here, some of the students um, found it much more difficult to connect. Hip hop is not what they listen to, not at all. However, from a theoretical viewpoint and using um, critical pedagogy in terms of what, how we work in the class, they were able to sort of look at how they engage um, the sorts of music that they listen to and sort of draw the correlations between what they're interested in, what's happening in hip hop, and then still able to engage in the cipher and um, make meaning and everything else. So that's what happened in that space. Um, with regards to um, this workshop here, Hip Hop Fair Make Some Noise, um, it was a taster. It was um, quite short. I think it was about an, an hour and a half. Um, the part participants were members of the public, students, academic staff as well, which was really interesting to see some of um, staff that don't usually engage with hip hop write some like rhymes. That was really interesting, really interesting to see. Good fun, all good fun, really. Um, um, and it was co-facilitated. This is another thing. Uh, at any um, opportunity that I can, I think it's really important. I'm not an MC. I'm not an MC. I can sing. I do come from a musical background. I didn't say that before. But I'm not an MC. So I really love to work with um, practitioners, those that that's their craft. That's what they do. So um, I worked a few times with Paris One, who's a UK MC. Little theory, mostly practice. Um, and this workshop is solely about using your voice and confidence, confidence building. A lot of the students that come in um, are not confident in using their voice. In seminars, um, some of them don't want to engage. They don't traditionally come from backgrounds where they feel that their voices um, should be heard. Am I all right for time? Almost there. Almost there. Um, so um, that's the point of that workshop. Again, um, potential... Um, teacher training students. Um, again, some found it difficult to connect to, um, but they were able to write bars, believe it or not, really impressive bars, and to perform them. That's like quite a lot for people that um, are, don't want, usually want to speak in a seminar um, and don't usually engage with hip hop, but they ma actually managed to write some bars that I can't write. I can't. And um, perform them, I really can't. It's, it's, it's not a good look if I try, believe me. <laughs> um, some of the feedback that I got, I've just sort of lumped them all together. Academic staff, students, and, um, and the public fed back that um, they found it really engaging, and the, the word that um, I've used quite a lot um, is relevant as well, relevant, and um, it should be made available to a wider audience. Now, we know that it's made available to a wider audience. We've been hearing practitioners all day. But these, this is like an introduction for some people. They've never encountered hip hop being used in these ways. So, conclusion. <laughs> a remix and a remix and a remix. So we can remix more people. Look at the fact that um, I didn't sort of use a wider, um, diverse sources of information. Um, the, the, the sources that I used were pretty old. There's so much more going on. Um, that was my reference point at the time, so I understand that being a limitation, definitely. So all these things, you can remix it in various different ways. And because now I am a lecturer and I do work in higher education, there is a potential opportunity for me to do action research. So there's some references, quite a few there. And I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>